Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Voice. tell you things are bad everybody knows things are bad it's a depression everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job the dollar buys a nickel's worth banks are going bust shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter punks are running wild in the street and there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do and there's no end to it we know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat we sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to riot. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. I want you to get up right now. Get up, go to your windows, open them, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Things have got to change. How many first, stations does this go out to? get mad. You say, I know it goes to Louisville and Atlanta. Hell. We're not going to take this anymore. Then we'll figure out what to do about the depression and the inflation and the oil crisis. But first, get up out of your chairs, open the window, stick your head out and yell, and say, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Yesterday on Facebook, um, one of my friends posted on a post that I had put on Facebook regarding um, homosexuals and homosexual uh, activity. <clears throat> and, and the guy posted, you're an angry man. My response to him was, yes, I am. Why? The question is, brother, when you see stuff like this, why are you not angry? And that's going to be the topic of today's show on voice. <clears throat> wow, where can I begin? I woke up this morning mad. I woke up this morning angry. Why? Because I'm tired. I'm tired of the looks on parents' faces when they get on the mic on TV after someone kills their child, sad, defeated, and begging for help. I am so tired of seeing that image portrayed in the media of defeated people. I am really tired of that. I'm tired of the nonchalant attitude that black people have towards racism. You act like it's a surprise. I mean, I, I, I look at posts on Facebook and somebody had posted something racially derogatory by white people in, in, in the following polls, right? Oh, I can't believe this is happening. Oh, this is 2014. Uh, and all this kind of stuff. Why, why, why can't you believe that racism is here? Back in 2008, when our president was elected, racism came back with a vengeance. It never went anywhere. It was swept underneath the rug, right? I mean... The way they treat a president is, is just so blatant. But in the same voice, they'll say, oh, we're not racist. It's not about race. It's about politics. Well, let's, let's fast forward, okay, to, to uh, 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 2012, 2013, 
when finally people started saying, oh, well, maybe it is about race. What do you mean, maybe? It is. So today I'm going to show you some clips uh, of some very racial things that are blatant that black people can't believe are happening today. <laughs> oh, that, that just, that, that bothers me. It really, really bothers me. Because everybody knows that I have an issue with, uh, with racism. A lot of people think I'm racist. I, I could care less what you think, to be honest. I'm going to say what I have to say because it needs to be said and somebody needs to say it. And you're not saying it. You feel me? When was the last time that a problem arose in your life and you ignored it and it went away? Name me one time. The problem ain't went nowhere. You're just ignoring it. Also, I play an online game, okay, called Lord of the Rings Online. And I am amongst some of the most racist people in the world playing a game. Black people need to get mad as hell, like we were back in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 70s, okay, when we pitched a bitch and raised hell about any little thing that happened. Because the mindset today of the black people is that, uh, we don't want to, you know, act all crazy because that's what they want us to do. you got to be freaking kidding me. A man shoots your child, and you're going to remain calm. You have no emotion, and then you're going to forgive him. Because your, your, your position is, right, if I act like a nigga, you feel me? If I act like a nigga and get upset and go ham, that's just what they want. You couldn't be further away from the truth if you took a jet plane to freaking Russia. Do you understand? You're doing exactly what they want. They don't want you to pitch a bitch. They don't want you to say anything because they don't want no consequence for their actions, right? Yesterday on Facebook, uh, there was a post about uh, the feminization of the black man and uh, Omar Epps. I guess he appeared somewhere wearing a skirt. I blew my top because it's unnecessary. You know what I mean? I mean, if you want to make a statement, man, make a statement about something important, right? Well, you, you're going you're gonna to come on TV wearing a skirt. You know, that's the wrong statement. That's the wrong message, and that's the wrong, just, just, it's just wrong on so many levels, right? But anyways, I, you know, so I saw this post. I blew a gasket, so I, I, I responded, as I always do, and I put up one of my posts ranting, right? Then one of my friends uh, on my stream posted, you're an angry man. He's right, I am angry. But the question is, how come he's not angry? And the question becomes, how come you're not angry? It seems like every month, every month, a black person is getting shot by a white person. This young woman's family learns new details of a tragic death, but the more they find out, the more upset they're getting. On the edge tonight, a woman shot dead, her body dumped, her family devastated. But now police say, it may have been just a tragic mistake. They say that someone killed her because they thought she was a criminal. Fox News' Andrea Isom live now in Dearborn Heights with more. Andrea? I'm going to read you a sentence from the press release issued to us from the Dearborn Heights police. And it says, a 19-year-old Detroit woman was fatally shot while standing on the front porch of the home. With that being said, her family says this was no accident. This was not self-defense because they say she, they were not told that she did anything wrong at all. They want the man responsible, the shooter, the killer to pay because right now they believe he's getting away with murder. This man just came to the door by somebody just knocking. She didn't break in his house. She didn't break a window. What, you seen somebody on your porch and you just start shooting? And then you say it was accidental? That wasn't accidental. That wasn't accidental. No. 19-year-old Renisha McBride is dead. Police telling us she took her last breath on this porch on Outer Drive in Dearborn Heights. So you did hear a gunshot? Yeah, it was pretty close. It was first thought 
and her family tells us they were first told that Renisha's body was dumped, discovered in this area. But no, she died here, right here. And detectives have identified the man who did it. When she was leaving off the porch, she was shot in the back of the head. Well, half of her face is gone. You know, we have to go and bury her, and they're not even knowing if she's gonna be able to have an open casket. You wanted her dead, that's that's my opinion. You wanted her dead. For her, for you to just shoot somebody in the head and not think twice about it, it's just, he shouldn't be free at all. This is a senseless death. My niece is gone. I feel it was, now right now, the way I'm feeling, I'm feeling it was racist. You seen this black African young lady knocking, not breaking in your house, not breaking a window, knocking for help. He didn't even try and see what kind of help she needed. Renisha's family believes that is why she was there, knocking, looking for help, though they don't know why or what happened from the time she left home until she ended up in Dearborn Heights. But when neighbors saw a crowd of police cruisers, they asked investigators. I say, what, what's going on? He say somebody get in his house or, or seems like force wise like the force and he got scared and shot the person scared of Renisha her loved ones think that's a lie what you did was not right if you should have did anything you should have called the police 911 there in Dearborn Heights police would have been there before you turned your face or turned your eyes the police have been pulling up in two or three minutes in Dearborn Heights he did not have to pull that gun out, and he did not have to kill my niece, and especially as she was leaving off the porch. Just shooting person by being scared, it don't make no sense to me. What was he afraid of? She, he the one with the gun. But he killed her. And he's out of jail? Wow. Could I possibly do that? Somebody knocked at my door and I pulled my shotgun out? And I shoot them while they're leaving off my porch instead of finding out what was the problem. Would I be standing here? No, I'd be in jail without a bond. I'm lost for words. I just don't feel like he should have been released. Renisha's family says she is quiet, hardworking, and keeps to herself and would never do anyone any harm ever. Now, police are not saying anything at all about this case except that they are still investigating. The family says they want justice and they're going to fight until they get it. Reporting live in Dearborn Heights, I'm Andrea Isom on The Edge. And Andrea, just to get this straight, the victim did not know the family of the man who shot her. That is correct, right? That is what the family says right now. They do not believe she knows this man at all. They believe somehow in her comings and goings. She went out Friday night. They say this happened early Saturday morning. Sometime from the time she left home and was going to uh, a friend's house, something happened. They don't know exactly what that is. They, don't, they still don't know where her car is. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions. But they said in that time, they believe she went to this house, maybe not even knowing exactly where she was, asking, looking for help. And they say because this man was afraid, thought she was an intruder, instead of asking and, you know, inquiring of what she needed or who she was, they say he just opened fire and now Renisha is dead. Let me also get this straight. The fatal wound was to the back of the head, which means she was walking away at the time. And this is what her... And, and Hill, this is what our family tells us right now. We're still waiting for confirmation from all that from police. But as I said, right now, they're not saying a lot. They issued a press release, which was about three sentences, and they aren't saying much at all about this person. We wanted to know the status of him. We wanted to say, is this guy at home right now? But that, they're not saying. So a whole lot more information Obviously we need to know, to know in too. the family. Obviously. And the first thing they say, oh, it's not racial. But when we look into... Right. When we look into the specifics of the shooting, racism is written all over it. Right? It's written all over it. And then black people. I'm like, as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm tired. I, you know, I, I, I'm just tired, man. I, I can't take it anymore. I can't take any more of this docile Negro shit. We're the only people on this planet that are docile. The only people. Do you understand? I mean, if you go into a Puerto Rican neighborhood and shoot somebody, man, they will kill you. You go into a Jewish neighborhood and shoot somebody, they will kill you. Do you understand? 
You go to a black neighborhood and shoot somebody, we'll remain calm. And if we do happen to get upset, we'll march. I am so sick and tired of Negroes marching. Do you understand? Oh, it, 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 it's really bothering me. Dashcam video helped provide a Bloomfield, New Jersey, New Jersey man's innocence. It's a story we first broke at 7 Online. And this 30-year-old faced a number of charges, including eluding police and insult. Investigative reporter Sarah Walsh obtained the Dashcam tapes, and she spoke exclusively with him. Sarah? Well, Diana and Sade, quite a turnabout. All of the criminal charges against Marcus Jeter have been dismissed. Two Bloomfield cops have now been indicted. A third quietly pleaded guilty to tampering and retired. It's all because of video the cops may have tried to hide. Get out the car! Get out! This is the Bloomfield Police Department's dash cam video that prosecutors say they never saw when they pursued criminal charges against 30-year-old Marcus Jeter. Notice his hands in the air. He was charged with eluding police, resisting arrest and assault, and also notice who throws repeated punches. If the tape hadn't surfaced... I was going to be doing jail. The incident began when cops were called to the Bloomfield home Jeter shares with his girlfriend. No charges were filed, and Jeter says he left after briefly talking to officers. They say you were eluding them. When they were behind me with the lights on, I pulled right over, you know. So you weren't trying to escape? No, I wasn't trying to escape. In a video from the first police car prosecutors did see, Jeter stops on the side of the Garden State Parkway. The cops pull out guns. Why didn't you just get out of the car? Because I was... I was afraid. There was a cop on my left with a gun pointed at me, and there was one on my right side with a shotgun pointed. I'm afraid that I might get shot. If you got out. Mm -hmm. The tape not initially turned over is on the dash of a second police car that comes from the opposite direction, crosses the median into ongoing traffic, and then strikes Jeter's car. There is no mention of that in any police report. When Jeter first told his attorney that part of the story... It was incredible. I didn't believe his story at that particular point in time. So you finally believed him then? Yes. The next thing I know, as he's coming around the car, the glass gets busted, and all the glass goes in my face. Get out the, Get car. Out the car! Your hands are up. My hands are up. As soon as he opened the door, one of the officers reached in and just punched me in my face. As he's trying to take the seatbelt off, he's elbowing me in my jaw. And I'm, you know, and I'm like, ah! And he's like, stop trying to take my gun. Oh, oh, my gun! Stop resisting arrest. Stop trying to take my gun. And as he's saying that, I just knew, and I, and I was sick, thinking back in my mind, like, okay, this is going to go wrong. Get down! Stop resisting! Stop resisting! Why are you trying to take my gun? Get off my gun! And right before they, um, when they opened the door about to put me in, the officer hits me in the back of the head again. As soon as prosecutors saw this video, they dismissed all of the charges against Jeter. Interesting to note, an investigation by Bloomfield PD's scandal-plagued Internal Affairs Division had found no wrongdoing by police officers. The blame is with the Bloomfield Police Department not providing that tape. If we hadn't had the tapes in this particular case, an innocent man would be in jail today. I'm sure that if this happened to me, it could happen to a bunch of other people, you know. Scary, right? It's a scary situation. And we were there exclusively today in Essex County Court in Newark, where Bloomfield police officers Sean Corder, there on the left, and Orlando Trinidad, who you will see here on the right, were arraigned on charges including conspiracy, official misconduct, and falsifying reports. Trinidad is also charged with aggravated assault. They pleaded not guilty. Now, look, we're in a war, people. People. Whether you want to believe it or not, we are in a freaking war. Do you understand? It's 2014. We are in a war. Nothing has changed but the strategy that they use to oppress us. The hate is still there. The racism is still intact. Right? But we can't see it. You know why we can't see it? Because we're, told we're too busy trying to get those people to love us, we don't teach our kids how to recognize racism. Now we got our kids out there, you know, I don't understand why these old guys, you know, uh, see all this stuff. I don't see it. And, you know, it's going to die off with them. 
let me let me give you a clue about racism, right? Right? Racism first reared his ugly head, right? Back in the days of Kemet, okay, ancient Egypt. I, I can't I can't quote you the year, right? But let's just say it was somewhere around three thousand AD. All right, excuse me, B C E. All right. Or no, I got that wrong. Let's say somewhere around five hundred B C E. Okay? Because that's around the time when the Europeans first put their nasty ass feet on the shores of Africa and started all that crap. You see, everywhere that these people have gone in this world, murder and mayhem and atrocities have followed. And then they give you Jesus. Now, that's a strategy because what Jesus is designed to do, okay, is to keep you under control, to keep you docile. Okay, to, 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 to make you love your enemy, because it says so in, in, in the book that they wrote. If your enemy strikes you, turn the other cheek. Pray for your enemy. Love your enemy. Do you understand? And then you'll get all this after you die. Prove it. Prove it. Because... Everything you know about so-called Jesus came from the book that was written by those people that conquered us. You feel me? Everything. Everything. Because you refuse to go outside the box and consider any other thing other than Jesus. I am so tired of hearing people yell, Jesus. Type Jesus on Facebook. Jesus ain't showing up. Jesus ain't, ain't, ain't coming here to save you. It took God himself thousands of years, according to that book, to answer the same plea of a people that were in the same, if not worse, position in Egypt, which there is no record of, but that's what the book says, right? Thousands of years. Look here, God, okay, has given us the tools to handle our own business. Just like you give your children the tools to handle their business. Why would it be any different? You understand? At some point, you tell your kids, you can't call on me to handle all your problems all the time. You got to learn to handle your problems yourself, right? But what that book teaches you, Give all your problems to Jesus, and he'll handle them, right? When you're in dire straits, call on the name of Jesus, and he'll handle it, right? Let me ask you a question. How come we still in the same position? You've been yelling Jesus for, what, 400 years since you learned it. There was a post on Facebook uh, had Dick Gregory's uh, picture on it. I'm not sure if he said it, but the post was uh, relevant. Okay? And the post read, um, I think I'll put it right here. It should be right there right now. The post read something along the lines of, uh, if your slave master wasn't Christian, would you be? Think about that for a minute. Right? Think about it. Because I submit this to you. Before those people set their feet, their foot on the shores of Africa, we had our own God. We had our own religion. We had our own way of worshiping, which didn't include dancing around the, uh, a church like an idiot. Do you understand? We had our own way of worshiping. Right? But when these people came, and presented white Jesus to you, they changed all that. Now, I could trip and stub my toe. Oh, 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 God, help me. Oh, Jesus, help me. A helpless people is what that book has rendered us to. Do you understand? We are, we, 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 we're now, we have been, 
I don't even know how to put it, man. But we're, we're just a helpless people. You understand? Look, I use this analogy a lot, and I'm going to use it again, right? I liken Negroes under dogs, and the white man unto the dog's master, right? Now, check this out. No matter what you do to that dog, that dog is going to love you regardless. Regardless, you can do anything to it. And the minute you say, come here, he's going to wag his tail and sniff your ass. That's what Negroes do to white people. So the white people are on a killing spree, and uh, they have a new get-out-of-jail-free card called Stand Your Ground. Okay, we got what? Started off with Trayvon Martin, right? And we go flash, uh, fast forward to, to Jordan Davis, okay? And there are others that, uh, that I can't remember. There's a young lady that, that uh, actually, this, this was very similar situations. There was a young lady that uh, was having car trouble with something. I think it was Michigan. She went on, uh, she went to uh, this house, knocked on the door to get help. White man answered, blew her away. Oh, I thought she was a burglar. She was trying to rob me. Then you got a guy uh, that was coming home from somewhere. He had an accident, didn't know where he was. He, he a white neighborhood, very dangerous. He walked, he, <laughs> he walked uh, until he found someone's house, walked up on the porch to, to seek help. They blew him away. Stand your ground. Hey, I thought he was a burglar. Right? He was going to break in the house. These people saw a black face and an opportunity, right? I mean, what other reason would you have if someone politely knocks on your door and says, can you help me? You're going to blow them away. Where's the aggression? So anyways, right, then you got, remember Troy Davis? Remember Troy Davis? Right? They said he killed a cop. They had, what, about eight, nine witnesses right around that time. They had all this evidence that they falsified against this man, right? Years passed. These witnesses said, uh, he didn't do it. I'm changing my testimony. Then they refused to take that into consideration, and they killed him anyway. Inside his mind.
I submit to you, man, they were covering up for some white dude. I guarantee you. Right? I mean, you know, from the beginning to date, it's been no change in the justice system. We get no justice. And then we get, a, we get on TV crying, looking all sad and whatnot. Oh, I forgive him. Because that's what that book taught you. That's what those people taught you. How are you going to seek justice from the people that killed your, your kid? They ain't going to give you justice. So we need to get mad as hell and not take it anymore. And we need to start tearing some shit up. There needs to be a consequence for things that these people do. Do you understand? Take a look at this clip. Troy Davis, the execution of Troy Davis. We'll be right back. The court ordered execution of Troy Anthony Davis has been carried out. The time of death is 11.08 p.m. At this time, the media witnesses will be coming out to give their firsthand account of what happened during the execution. Basically, it went very quietly. The McPhail family and friends sat in the first row. The warden read the order asked if Troy Davis had anything to say, and Davis lifted his head up, looked at that first row, and made a statement in which he said he wanted to talk to the McPhail family and said that despite the situation you're in, he was not the one who did it. He said that he was not personally responsible for what happened that night, that he did not have a gun. He said to the family that he was sorry for their loss, but also said that he did not take their son father, brother. He said to them to dig deeper into this case, to find out the truth. He asked his family and his family and friends to keep praying, to keep working and keep the faith. And then he said to the prison staff, the ones he said who are going to take my life, he said to them, may God have mercy on your souls. And his last words were to them, may God bless your souls. Then he put his head back down procedure began and about 15 minutes later it was over. What I saw tonight, what Jason saw tonight, what the McPhail family saw tonight and what your colleagues, the journalists who spoke with you earlier saw tonight was indeed a legal lynching. And one thing I want to get clear is just because it was legal doesn't mean it was right. Slavery was legal, but it wasn't right. Jim Crow segregation was legal, but it wasn't right. And the, and the killing of innocents, such as Troy Anthony Davis, however legal it may be in Georgia, however legal it may be in the eyes of the Supreme Court of the United States, this sort of legalized lynching is not right. Okay, we're back. Uh, I remember that time on Facebook. Everybody on Facebook was, oh, Troy Davis said, this is bad. This is this, this is that. You know what I mean? They executed him three days later. He was a ghost. Nobody was posting about him no more. Out of sight, out of mind. This is our people. This is our people. Then Trayvon happened, right? Everybody changing their profile pictures. You know what I mean? Oh, Trayvon this, Trayvon that, yada, yada, yada. Right? George Zimmerman walks. Like I knew he would because the jury was all white. Right? Look at people's profile pictures. Very few people still are repping Trayvon. Because we vowed that we would keep our profile pictures there, not uh, 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 repping Trayvon and not change them until justice was served. There's still a civil suit coming. We can still get justice in that. My profile picture is, has been the exact same since I changed it to Trayvon. What is yours? Out of sight, out of mind. I said that to say this. We don't show any solidarity. We don't show any unity. We don't show any togetherness. The white man knows that it's only going to be an issue for uh, a couple of days, like the news cycle, right? After a couple of days, it'll be history. Niggas would be under something else somewhere twerking. You know what I mean? 
They know that. And they know the worst thing that can happen is that niggas will march. Then they go to the bar and laugh about it over beer. <laughs> they marching again. Really? Where are at? I want to take a video. You understand? You see them come and take a video. You think they're with me. Oh, we got white people with us. No, they're there looking at you because you're a spectacle. You got Al Sharpton, who I had, I had grown to respect, but when he does shit like this, I don't respect that man. Because back in the day, when everybody thought he was a shyster, he was on fire. Shyster or not, he brought, he brought it to the table. Whatever evil these people did, he, showed the, he shined the light on it, right? And he told people about it. Then you had a couple of bad apples that lied about stuff. He got caught up. Now everybody thinks, oh, he's, he's a shyster. Because white people are telling you that. You name me one black leader that white people have agreed with. Because every black leader that we have had or have, unless that black leader is in their pocket, they slander his name, say he's evil and racist and all this and that and the other, anti-Semite. You know, anti-Semite, anti-Semite. Excuse the expression, but screw the Jews. They hate black people worse than they hate dogs. And yeah, they had slaves too. You want to know what I read they used to do with their slaves, the money-hungry bastards, right? They used to take the female slaves and they get all the guys in their family to rape this female slave to produce more slaves to make more money and satisfy their sexual thirst. Two birds with one stone. It's a great day to be a Jew, right? These are the people you read about in that book, right? God's chosen people. Yeah. Okay, but anyways, right? People, we got to get mad as hell, man. We got to start giving these people a consequence. I got a brother um, that uh, I'm pretty close to on Facebook. He's a pastor out in uh, Arizona. I'm not going to say his name because I don't have permission to use his name, right? <clears throat> and me and him talk. I mean, he's very down to earth, brother. We don't always see eye to eye, but we're very cordial to each other. And he, you know, he, he schools me a lot, teaches me a lot of things. You know what I mean? I, I, I have the utmost respect for this man, you know? And um, he posted yesterday of uh, a church member or church, I don't know, they're holding a boxing match, and one of the members decided to do blackface. So he put black polish all over him, and now he's a black boxer. And he posted that, and he said he couldn't believe it. I'm like, dude, really? This is what I rant and rave about all the time. This is the real world. This is what's in the world. And those people don't have any remorse. They mean to do it. They do it on purpose. I mean, you don't by accident put black polish all over yourself and, and act like a black person and say, oh, I didn't mean it. What if your kid did that and you, and, and you said that? Then you got the clowns that did the Trayvon Martin thing with blackface. The post on that, oh, this is 2014. I can't believe that this is still happening. And what hole do you live in that you can't see racism? Which is probably not your fault because your parents probably didn't teach you how to recognize it. You probably hang around with a bunch of white people that say racist stuff all the time and they just go way over your freaking head. You're neat. You're, you're so sensitive. And you got you got to ignore some stuff. Really? You want to ignore something? Why don't you ignore me when I blast those bastards and call them for what they're doing instead of coming on my post telling me I need to stop? What you need to do is stop telling me that. And I, I don't said this about three, four times in these videos and, and I don't know how many times on Facebook. You need to stop coming to me and telling me to be quiet because not one of you people are standing up to these crackers, right? Spewing all this racist stuff. You're ignoring it like it's going to go away. That's why they're still there. Nobody's giving them a consequence. Get mad as hell. Do you understand? You know what else I'm mad about? Right? You know what else I'm mad about? Maritza Alexander, Melissa Alexander. 
You understand? She tried to use to stand your ground. They gave her 20 years. She didn't hurt nobody. She didn't kill nobody. Bullet didn't strike not one part of this dude's flesh. You understand? Right? Well, she got 20 years. Angela Corey sent her to jail for 20 years. Angela Corey, the same DA that came in with all this fanfare, oh, we're going we're gonna to convict George Zimmerman because he shot Trayvon Martin, and they failed. You know why they failed? Because they allowed the judge to throw race out of the, uh, out of the trial, just as they did in, in the Jordan Davis trial. They take race out. Now all you got is a jury full of white people, right, and a white person's uh, word against yours. That's what you got. Who do you think is going to win that battle? <laughs> there was a video, I think you, a lot of people seen this video. The little kids that uh, they look at the doll, the little black doll, the little white doll, right? You know what I mean? They always pick the white doll, or the majority of them pick the white doll. The white doll is nice. The white doll is beautiful. They would rather play with the white doll. Let me give you. Let, let me tell you why that is. Because they uh, somebody posted that video uh, yesterday, and this person uh, she didn't mean no harm, and I'm not I'm not dogging her out, but she said something that that just bothered me, <clears throat> right? She said, uh, uh, "These kids' parents uh, are teaching them self hate." Well, that's not always the case. I mean, it could be. I'm not saying she's wrong, but I'll submit this to you because this is what I researched and studied, and this is what I found to be true. Subliminal messaging and symbolism is why our mindset is the way it is, along with Christianity. You understand? Because look here. From the day that you're able to, you're plopped in front of a TV and you're like this. Think about it. You're a baby. Your mind is empty. You understand? It's waiting to be filled with knowledge. But your parents, for whatever reason, work, cooking, busy, having sex, smoking drugs, whatever, they plop you behind in front of the TV. So the TV, in essence, raises you. You know what I mean? So you start watching TV not knowing, not knowing that TV is full of symbolism and subliminal messaging. Years ago, they even got caught doing that. And it's, there's a law now that you can't put subliminal messages in, in, in TV anymore, but they still do it. Symbolism, symbolism is everywhere. They started that in books. That was the first media, right? Then when the visual came, which was more powerful, now that's their main tool. So what happens is, is that we watch all this stuff full of caucasoids shown in great light. They're all good, saving the day. They're superheroes. You know what I mean? They're all this. They're all that. And then you got the Negroes in subservient roles or slaves or bad guys getting arrested by cops. You know what I mean? Don't watch the news or you, know, you just think Negroes are the worst people in the freaking world. Right? This is what your kids, and as a kid, this is what we were raised on coming up. Not knowing that we were being mind fucked. We thought we were, oh, Nate, it's only entertainment. Nate, it's only TV. It's only a movie. No, it's mind fucking in progress. If you can't recognize the symbols, if you can't see the subliminal message, if you can't recognize the underlying message that is being put forth in that movie, you're already caught. You're already captive. Right? Everybody got a problem when, when uh, I, I speak out on the one-sided interracial relationship that is shown in the media. 98.9% .9 of the time, whenever there is an interracial couple, it is always white man, black woman. Don't believe me? Check it out. That is the sole reason I stopped watching network TV. Sole reason. 
I don't watch network TV no more. I don't even watch TV no more. You understand? But I wouldn't watch network. All you people watching Scandal? Wow. I guess you're living vicariously through Kerry Washington and wish you had a white man, right? It seems like our people won't be happy until the Negro race. I can't say we're pure black because no Negro in this country is pure. But the Negro race has been completely mulatticized. Mulatticized, if, I, if, if that's a word and I said it right. Or annihilated into oblivion. Do you understand? Yeah, you can't, you're not responsible for who you love. And, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, loving, loving uh, somebody outside their race. No, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you overdo it, there's a consequence. There's a consequence for any and everything that you do in this world. And that's one of them. You want a good example of hate? People say that hate, <laughs> racism is only in, in, in the United States. I read a post uh, the other day. Somebody commented, said, oh, you people in the, in the United States are so stuck in the 19th century where all you see is color. I wish I can grab that person just shaking. Because racism is worldwide. It ain't just the United States. Racism is worldwide. Do you understand? The British, the British wiped out the inhabitants of Tasmania. I thought Tasmania was a freaking cartoon by Disney until I found out it was real. Right? And then uh, uh, they make a little cartoon, the Tasmanian Devil, just to further insult these people. They wiped out a whole race of people, black people, on an island. There were 40 left, and they eventually died out. Right? Then you got something I found out just the other day. Uh, one of my friends hit me to this on Facebook. King Leopold in the Congo killed and maimed over 20 million Africans. 20 million! Cut off their right hand. Cut off legs. Cut off genitals. Hung them from trees and whatnot. Cut off heads and line their, uh, their uh, gardens with the heads of Africans. And then you know what they did? Right? After the world finally said, okay, enough is enough. They changed Belgium's history because he was King Leopold of Belgium. They changed their history to make King Leopold a great humanitarian to Africa. And they got statues commemorated to uh, represent that. Statues, gold statues of that. But at the same time, they won't give reparations to the Congo. You know why? No, we don't want to give the uh, reparations to the Congo because they'll do nothing but squander the money, and we don't want to take responsibility for what Leopold did because at that time, he wasn't a part of us. White people, this is how they think. This is their mindset. <coughs> Excuse me. Right? Then you, got, uh, then you got people that we celebrate as great men, Alexander the Great, uh, Columbus, you know, Columbus Day and all that, Napoleon and all these racist ass crackers that came over to Africa, you know what I mean? Destroyed all kinds of stuff over there, history, culture, raped women, enslaved people, killed them. Uh, Alexander killed uh, roughly about the same amount as Leopold did. You know what I mean? Columbus up and down the west coast of Africa in the slave trade. You know, he brought the first slaves. Uh, was it him? I can't remember. Whoever was sailing on the good ship Jesus brought the first bunch of slaves ever taken from Africa to the Pope in Italy because the Pope ordained slavery. He said that the black people were below animals. So you can enslave them. It's okay. It's okay with God. And then he went and got his slaves and you know what I mean? So when I hear people say that racism is either 
on the decline and not existing only in America, I get mad as hell, and I don't want to take that shit anymore. Because there's no way in the world that unless you experience what we as a people experience, you can understand anything that we think, do, or say, let alone what we go through. You understand? Why don't you people get over it? Why, why, why don't you just... I, I'm not responsible for what my ancestors did. No, but you represent what your ancestors did. And you know what? It ain't just the ancestors because some of your people are still doing it today. So this is your legacy and this is your history. Own it. Step up and man up and take it. And do something about it. You understand? Everybody says, oh, I got black friends, I got white friends, this, that, and the other. I don't hear your white friends screaming at the top of their lungs over the, the racist people that are screaming racist shit at the top of their lungs. I don't hear your white friends, none of my white friends, yelling, ah, oh, you need to shut up. No, they'll come to us and console us. Oh, they're bastards, this, that, and the other. But they won't turn around and go tell those people where to go. Very few of them will. And then you got the mulatto people, the mixed breeds. I ain't hating on y'all, but here's what I want y'all to do. Either pick a side or fall back because this middle ground shit ain't working. I had a friend. I didn't know that she was mixed. I thought she was, well, mixed white and black. I thought she was Hispanic, but she got upset because I was using the word cracker. You understand? I'm like, I'm not talking to you because when I say cracker, I'm talking to the racist white people, man. I'm not talking to the regular people because all white people are not racist, and I never said that. Although a lot of people like to accuse me of that, I had never in my life said that. But what I did say is that I hate the white race as a whole for the atrocities that they committed against our people or my people. But I have a lot of white friends. Man, when I was coming up, I had nothing but white friends. I had to deprogram myself and indoctrinate myself back into the black experience. I used to go to the club, man, and think I was cool, and people said I sounded like a white boy. So don't tell me, don't, don't, don't give me that crap. You know what I mean, as a child, I went to Vermont, stayed the summer with white people for, twi for two years. They came down to get a black child from the uh, inner city to bring back to Vermont to, s to spend the summer with their kids so their kids can get used to being around people of color. And I thought that was a beautiful thing. I had no problem with it. Scared, because I didn't know what to expect. I was a kid. But I had no problem with it, right? We took a trip to Canada. It was great. We stopped in a rest stop for the night, right? And I still remember this like it was yesterday, man. Um, you know, I was a kid. I didn't know nothing about racism at that time. And, uh, you know, I, we were at the beach. I put on my swimming suit, Keen and Susan, Jamie, and uh, I forget the girl's name, the sister. We were all going swimming. We ran, jumped in the water. I ran, jumped in the water, man, and all those white people ran out of the water. So... Keen and Susan, I guess they knew what was going on. I had no clue. I recognized it, but I was wondering what was wrong. So I ran out of water thinking something was in it. They just grabbed me and brought me somewhere else. We went somewhere else. They had a picnic or something. Later that day, they had a baseball game. So uh, Keen and Susan asked if I could play in the game. They said, yeah. Right? So I stepped up the bat. Little did they know, you know, I, <laughs> I was the home run king back at home, right? So I, I'm stepping up. I'm like, I'm going to knock this thing out the park. And I'll never forget, the pitcher's name was Vivian. Vivian. <laughs> and it was a guy, right? I thought that was funny, but I didn't say anything. And I'm standing there ready to hit the ball. And uh, you know how they say, better, 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 swing, better, better, swing. They changed that. Swing, nigger, nigger, swing, nigger. Look at the niggers. Nigger, swing, nigger, nigger is what they were saying. After about three minutes of that, Keen and Susan grabbed me, and we went into our trailer. You know what I mean? And they didn't say anything. We just watched TV. Or so. I don't know what we did, but we didn't do that. Um, but racism, man, you know what I mean? It's everywhere. It's everywhere, dog. So um, I'm going to show you another clip. 
right, of uh, what do I got on tap up here? Judge Mathis talking about uh, Troy Davis. By Troy now, Davis. the world is aware that Troy Davis, a 42-year-old black American from Georgia, was executed after the Supreme Court of the United States denied his 11th hour appeal. He was convicted in the 1989 murder of an off-duty Savannah, Georgia police officer, but he maintained his innocence until the very end. Davis exhausted all of his appeals in the court system, fighting to win a new trial. He presented affidavits from seven of the nine witnesses at his trial who recanted their original testimony. Despite the overwhelming doubt surrounding his guilt, Davis never received a new trial and was unjustly put to death by lethal injection. I don't like to contradict other judges, but Davis should have been granted a new trial so that he could prove his innocence. This was, without a doubt, a grave miscarriage of justice. We've long known our justice system is broken. Davis's execution shows us just how flawed the system has become. Too often, prosecutors and parole boards simply refuse to admit they are wrong or have doubts about the guilt of the accused. Our nation's governors are often unwilling to sacrifice their political careers in the name of doing the right thing. Troy Davis was failed at every step of the judicial process. America must revamp its legal system, beginning with the way we investigate and arrest suspects and continuing to the way we prosecute them and the way we handle appeals. We must not allow prosecutors to convict an individual based solely on eyewitness testimony when new evidence is introduced or witnesses recant their testimony. A new trial should automatically be granted when this occurs. Lastly, we need a nationwide ban on the death penalty. One innocent man put to death is one too many. If we can't be certain of the legitimacy of the convictions, the practice must be halted. It is criminal that this man was executed with so much doubt surrounding his case, and Georgia has blood on its hands. Okay, so short and sweet. That's another episode of Voice. Um, I, well, no, before I say that, let me, let, let me go here, right? Someone on Facebook asked me, do I have a plan? What are we going to do? And they could have been sincere in that question, but I took offense to it because I thought they were trying to put me on the spot. You know what I mean? Because I was ranting about a lot of stuff. Not everybody has a plan, right? But that doesn't mean that we can't speak out on wrongdoings and issues. Do you understand? Because we're in a war, people. This is a war, and everybody has a role. You know what I mean? My role in this war is to be a motivator and a soldier. And if there is nobody else out there, then I would have to step up and lead. But I'm not a leader. That's not my role. What you, you need to do is find your role in this war other than ignoring stuff or yelling Jesus and running up and down the church aisle. You know, that ain't solving a damn thing. You know what I mean? You need to get in where you fit in in this war and start to make a difference. Open your freaking mouth and say something. Offer a consequence to these people. You need to get mad as hell and not take it anymore. I'm Nate Patterson, and this is Boris. After the show, it's the after party, yeah. After the party, it's the hotel lobby, yeah. After the Belby, then it's probably Chris. Chris. And after the original, it's probably this. Yes, my best stop, BS stop. Remix with the homie from the Midwest side. Game recognized, game hoes do too. It's a new two live crew, I suppose you're new. So, thugs, pop the toasters, but don't approach us. Or bullets will chase you like Moet Mimosas. Catch us both coasters, racing twin coaches. Boxes with glass to the pop, you to make you closer. Whoever come closest, you've been warned. But niggas don't get the picture till the weapons is drawn. Make your way backstage, baby girl, it's on. And we'll be drinking till six in the morning. In the back of the club with my mom. Popping bottles of Chris with my mom. Put the bar on the tap for my mom. Throwing hundreds up for grabs for my mom.